two starships failed. Two separate reasons. Finally, SpaceX reveals why. Let's get into it. Hey everybody, welcome back to the channel. Thank you so much once again joining me for Tea Time. Today, we have a little bit of focus and misty morning combination. So good, so good. That bergamot, that zing. I hope you're joining me with your cup of tea, hanging out, talking space, SpaceX, Starlink, Linux, AI, all kinds of good tech. Today is going to be a SpaceX day just before tomorrow's big launch. IFT9 is gonna to happen tomorrow. Matter of fact, need to put in a little plug here. I will be live for IFT9 tomorrow. If you're not yet subscribed, subscribe to the channel and turn notifications on so you know exactly when I'm going to be live. We hang out. There's usually hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of us here hanging out, talking about the flight and just enjoying it. The banter is what's really fun. Anyways, join me tomorrow for IFT9. Today, we're going to be talking about IFT7 and 8 and the mishaps that ended up happening. So, they both blew up right around the exact same time, which was very odd. And everyone was saying it has to be the same problem or at least something very similar. And now we know that that is absolutely not the case. And they have the final report, let's say out. FAA did their research and their investigation. Of course, SpaceX did too, compared notes, and now we know exactly what happened. So there was a really good article over on Space News. I want to read some of that to you. If you were here on Friday, you heard me read some of it already. But I thought that this is really interesting. Once again, on the back of IFT9 going up tomorrow, IFT9 is going to be a really big one because they're going to actually reuse the Super Heavy. So that Super Heavy that's being used on IFT9 is the same one that was used for IFT7, I believe. And they caught it in the Mechazilla chopstick arms and they refurbished it. What's really interesting about that is that there is 33 Raptor engines and 29 out of those Raptor engines are the exact same ones that were used for IFT7. That's pretty damn cool. Only four new engines. That's really good for the whole idea of making a reusable rocket. That's the whole point. That's the whole thing that Elon Musk is trying to do here. The same thing that he does with his Falcon 9. He wants to be able to launch him, catch him, launch him, catch him, launch him. You get it. Anyways, before we get into this article, I just want to say that if you enjoy the content, throw it a thumbs up. That's very helpful. Don't forget, like I said before, to subscribe, turn notifications on, do all of that happy stuff. More importantly, share. Share the channel, share the video if you do enjoy it. If you want to give back and say thank you for all of my hard work, there's a little thank you button right down there. You can click on that, give a dollar or two if you want. If not, it's perfectly fine. The video is still free. Consider becoming a member of the channel. That would be even better, much, much better actually. And if you want more SpaceX Starlink content, I have just under 500 videos I've put together over the last 48 months just for you. I'll put a link here. Don't click on it yet. When you're done watching this video, check that out. So let's jump right into this article. It starts out by saying, failure of SpaceX's Starship on its most recent test flight had a different root cause than the previous failure, despite happening at about the same time. SpaceX released details May 23rd about the cause of the Flight 8 mishap that took place on March 6th, when several Raptor engines on the Starship's upper stage shut down and the vehicle started to tumble. You remember that? We just saw it doing this thing. We're like, oh, yep, that's, that's not good. That's not good, guys. Boom. And that was it. It was all blown up over the Turks and Caicos and the Bahamas. Horrible. The vehicle re-entered, breaking up over the Caribbean. Exactly. The timing of Flight 8's failure was similar to Flight 7 in January, which also featured several engines shutting down and a loss of communication about eight, eight and a half minutes after liftoff. However, SpaceX says the two failures had different causes. That's good to know. Finally, it's not the exact same cause that they didn't fix the first time on IFT7. Quote, while the failure manifested at a similar point in the flight timeline as Starship's seventh flight test, it is worth noting that the failures are distinctly different. In the case of Flight 8, SpaceX said that one of the center Raptor engines in the Starship suffered a hardware failure, details of which the company did not disclose. That failure enabled, quote, 
inadvertent propellant mixing and ignition that caused the loss of the Raptor. Immediately thereafter, the other two center Raptor engines shut down, along with one of the three outer vacuum-optimized engines with larger nozzles. The vehicle then lost all control authority. The company said it made changes to the Raptors in the Starship's upper stage with additional preload on key joints and new nitrogen purge systems as well as improvements to the propellant drain system. A future version of Raptor in development will also have reliability improvements to address the problem seen on Flight 8. On Flight 7 in January, SpaceX said the vehicle suffered a harmonic response several times stronger than expected, creating additional stress on the vehicle's propulsion system. That caused leaks to trigger the fire in the engine bay, or that attic area. Quote, the mitigations put in place after Starship's seventh flight test to address harmonic response and flammability in the Starship's attic section worked as designed prior to the failure on Flight 8. The SpaceX statement about Flight 8 came a day after the Federal Aviation Administration, or the FAA, provided its final approval for the next Starship test flight, Flight 9, which SpaceX confirms is scheduled for no earlier than May 20. 7th at 7.30 p.m. Don't hold that time, but I think the date is going to be right, May 27th. Hang in there. A major change for Flight 9 involves a super heavy booster. Flight 9 will involve the first reflight of that booster using a booster that originally launched on Flight 7. Some components of the booster were replaced after Flight 7, but SpaceX said, quote, large majority, in big quotes, of the booster will be hardware that previously flew, including 29 out of the 33 Raptor engines, like I said before. Unlike the previous four test flights, SpaceX will not attempt to recover the Starship's Super Heavy booster with the catch by the launch tower at Starbase. In other words, no Mechazilla catch, no chopstick catch, which kind of sucks. I always love that. That's just amazing to me. The booster will instead test new flight profiles after separation, including controlling how it flips to orient itself from a boost back burn and use a higher angle of attack on its descent, both intended to reduce the propellant needed to recover the booster. SpaceX will also test alternative engine landing profiles. Quote, to maximize the safety of the launch infrastructure at Starbase, the Super Heavy booster will attempt these experiments while on a trajectory to an offshore landing point with a hard splashdown planned off the coast of Starbase. The Starship's upper stage will attempt many of the same demonstrations planned for previous flights, but which could not be carried out because of the failures. This includes the Raptor engine relight while in space, deployment of eight mass simulators, this is good point here, eight mass simulators of next generation Starlink satellites and tests of re-entry technologies. So there's a lot going on here with Flight 9. IFT-9 is just going to be chock full of a ton of tests. And that's probably one of the reasons why they're like, you know what, let's just land this thing in the Gulf of America and just be done with it. We don't have to worry about damaging the star base and the launch site at all. So that's what they're doing. They're going to really aggressively come in to save fuel, to come in hotter, faster, and then flip it at the last minute. Once again, using as little fuel as possible. That is very, very important. Also, they're going to be testing actively cooled tiles instead of passively cooled tiles. They're going to be testing out a lot of the new structures that are put into place where we have the extension of 25% more propellant. So the entire unit is taller. It's bigger. There's things that are internal that are new. Also, the flaps, instead of being at 180 degrees, the flaps are tucked in like a bird and they're smaller. So they're going to be testing that. Are they as nimble as the bigger flaps? Do they melt? Does the skin melt off with plasma pouring off it with this new tucked in variant? So instead of at 180 degrees, they're sitting at about 140 or somewhere around right there degrees. Once again, tucked back like a bird when it's coming through the air. So there's a lot going on here. 
A lot to be excited about. I'm excited. I cannot wait to see what ends up happening tomorrow. I hope the thing doesn't blow up over the Turks and Caicos Islands, the Bahamas. I just hope that everything goes as planned. One of the biggest things that I want to see is those mass structures, let's say. Basically, let's call them SpaceX Starlink version 3 satellite duds or dummies because that's what they're going to be launching through the little Pez dispenser at the top of that fairing. So that's really exciting because that means that we're getting one step closer to getting those version 3 satellites on orbit and all of us SpaceX Starlink users are going to get faster speeds, lower latency, less congestion. This is going to be better, 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 better because those version 3s are four times the size of the version 2 minis that are currently being placed in orbit with the Falcon 9 but they're also 20 times the capacity. 20 times. This means that only one of the version 3 satellites is the equivalent to 20 of the version 2 minis. That is amazing. And instead of being able to place on orbit 27 at a time, they'll be able to put on orbit 100 plus every time. So that's a really, really big thing. Really big thing. So if you just think about it mathematically, if they are to put 100 of the version 3s on orbit, 100, it would be the equivalent to putting 2,000 <laughs> on orbit. So it'd be like, let's say, I don't know, close to 20 trips. Let's call it like 17 trips to get those up there in comparison to one trip. The Starship can hold so many more, but also the capacity of each individual one is 20 times, 20x. That is a big thing. That is massive. Exciting. Absolutely exciting. Anyways, guys, what say you? You find this interesting? I know I do. Are you going to be here with me tomorrow? Why not? <laughs> be here tomorrow. Hang out with me. Let's watch this thing go up. And hopefully it doesn't rud before we see all of the tests done. Boom. <laughs> it's always exciting no matter what happens, right? We're not gonna end up with that catch, but hopefully everything else is exciting. And what I understand is there's more cameras on board now, so we should be able to get a really good view of that Pez dispenser door opening and shooting out those dummy satellites. We will see. Anyways, guys, if you enjoy it, throw it a thumbs up and don't forget to head over to my website, jchristina.com. Check out my merch, my tees, my shirts, my books and everything else over there. If there's something you like, please pick it up and help support me and my family. Many blessings to you and your family. Stay safe, stay healthy, stay connected and hang out with me tomorrow for IFT9. Take care, guys. Love you.